Okay, let's go ahead and start. The... I don't even have to say the second words. <laughs> Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the January 26th meeting of the Regional Housing Council for Thurston County. Uh, and anybody that's been watching this uh, game show for the last year can see that we have some new faces here. So I wanted to, we'll do, do our, our, our normal introductions by <laughs> jurisdiction, um, but just ask folks to, uh, you know, stop for a second and, and talk about the, any changes that were made from your jurisdiction. Uh, and then we will um, make sure that there's opportunities with staff and, and uh, you know, staff from the county in particular for some onboarding. Uh, but we haven't really had to think about that yet, given that this is only our second year of the Regional Housing Council existing formally. So um, with that, I'm going to go ahead and jump in and uh, just uh, ask folks if everybody's okay with the agenda before I go with introductions. Okay, we have an agenda. Um, and then I'll go ahead then and uh, start. I'm going to do alphabetical order this time. So I'm going to start in the city of Lacey. Carolyn, can you introduce your folks? Oh, and actually for the new folks, we use first names here. So is that okay with everyone? Absolutely. Okay, perfect. I just want to make sure that we don't need to do any shifts. So Carolyn, Lacey. Alrighty. Hi, everybody. Um, I will remain as Lacey's lead on the council, but we are, um, Andy Ryder, our mayor, is going to be our alternate member of this group. Excited to have him be part of this process. He's with us today, as is our city manager, Scott Spence, uh, Rick Walk from our community and economic, and ec, uh, bleh, economic development staff, and Kelly Adams, the amazing Kelly. And I hope I didn't miss anybody. I think I got us all. Okay. Thank you, Carolyn. And I'll just bring out up one comment from the pre-meeting and say, thank you, Scott Spence, for keeping Kelly Adams assigned to this project in her new role. Uh, we really appreciate her and we think she's gonna do a great job in the new job at the city of Lacey. So. And I really look forward to working with everyone here. Welcome. Welcome, Mayor Ryder. It's good to see you, too. Good to see you, buddy. Okay, so then I'm going to go to Olympia. And so that's me, uh, Jim Cooper uh, from the City Council. And on our team, we have our Assistant City Manager, Keith Staley. We have our Home Fund and Community Development Block Grant Leader, Darian Lightfoot. And we have our alternate Danny Madrone from the city council. So our, our representatives are not changing this year uh, and we're just happy to be here. So let's go to Thurston County, Carolina, if you have a good connection. Yes, hopefully it comes out clear. Uh, Carolina Mejia, Thurston County Commissioner. Um, things did not change in the county side as well. Um, Commissioner Ty Menser is still my alternate if I'm not able to attend these meetings. Uh, today with staff, we have uh, Keely Marino uh, and Tom Webster, and I'm going through the Brady Bunch right now of Zoom screen and Ramiro Chavez and Jacinda Stelges. Um, and we're happy to be here today. Thank you. All right, thank you. Okay, we're gonna go to Tumwater, Michael. Hi, uh, Michael Altauser, Tumwater City Council. I am joined um, again with Joan Cathy as the alternate for which I am I'm very grateful to be able to join this body with, with Joan and being able to learn from her expertise whenever we meet. Um, and from the staff side, we're with John Doan, our city administrator, as well as Brad Medrude from our planning department. So our, our contingent is, is the same as it was the last time we met in December. Thank you. And then just for the new folks, I'll throw in, you know, I, the offer was made to do onboarding with county staff, but I would offer, offer that also from, uh, on, from council member Kathy's behalf, because she's the only one that's here that's been here for the last four or five versions of this conversation. And a lot of that history is super important as we move ahead. So uh, Joan, I'm offering you up uh, if you don't mind. <laughs> Great. Uh, let's go to Yelm. Uh, Holly. Sounds like you're throwing me in the fire. <laughs> you're welcome, Joan. 
<laughs> Hi, I'm Holly from the Yelm City Council. Um, I will or am being replaced with Brian Hess. Um, as some of you may know, we had several vacancies on our council. So we're starting off uh, the year with almost a whole new council and a new mayor. So I don't see Brian on here yet, but um, he will definitely be representing starting next month. Great. Okay. Well, any of us would be happy to sit down with him and help him get grounded. So thank you, Holly. All right, great. Well, we have everyone here. Is there anyone that didn't get introduced? Okay, thank you. So we have no one signed up for public comment and we do keep that open. Uh, at least as of three o'clock, there was no one, anyone, not anyone. So Kelly, anything additional? I do not see anything, Chair Cooper. Okay, great. So uh, we have no public comment this evening. Uh, and then we'll, so then we'll go to uh, next is we need an approval of the minutes for October and December. Is there a motion? So moved, this is Michael. I'll second. We have a motion and a second. Any amendments? All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries, thank you. Okay, so that takes us to the, the agenda item of the year, which is the second ever election for chair and vice chair of the Regional Housing Council. Uh, it's a big deal, uh, and not just because I've been the chair, but because of how much work we have all done to get to this point, uh, and the acknowledgement that there is a lot of work left to do, and that includes some exciting news from the county, but we're going to save that uh, for a few minutes from now, but, you know, just, I think there's there's more work that comes from that county decision this week for, for us, absolutely. Um, and so I'm going to go ahead and conduct an election for the chair and the vice chair. Um, but I'd like to take just a moment of personal privilege, if folks are okay with it, and, and make a couple of comments. Um, so I just wanted to say thank you to the four jurisdictions or the five jurisdictions for sitting down and creating this conversation in our county. And, you know, just historically for, for the new folks. Uh, the new version of the Regional Housing Council exists because the three big cities got together and, and really were uncomfortable and unhappy with what was happening at a regional level. I wanted to do it differently, wanted to find a way to do it differently, and very quickly realized uh, what we all know uh, is that we need each other. And regardless of the politics of the day uh, in any given jurisdiction, uh, Inter, you know, regional and interjurisdictional work is the expectation of all of our voters. Uh, and we are working in the middle of, you know, other than the climate emergency, the largest emergency that go local government has seen uh, in any of our lifetimes. And, and so it's, it's significant that we're all here. And I think I just wanted to, to thank everyone for that because it was, been a, it was a little unclear how it, would, how it would play out and how it would look. Uh, and we we made some big steps to get to this point. I also think there's a lot of steps to make to continue to make this process and this conversation more efficient for, you know, the the two people that matter most to me, which is the the you know the 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 most vulnerable that are living outside in our community, and our voters. And the, those those two things, uh, you know, I think that th that we meet the expectations, but there's so much work to do. And we know that from our local elections. You know, I think several of us were doing quite a bit of doorbelling this year. And, you know, people say that people are talking about climate and housing uh, as the biggest issues. And I would say they're talking about both, but they're talking about housing times 1000. And there is no there is no second issue for people across our community. And we've seen that whether you're in the private sector or the social service sector or the government sector, that there is a lot of work that we need to do to to really continue to do our best to put a bandaid on a problem that we won't be able to solve on our own. And we all know that and we all know that we need massive influx from the state and federal government. We know that while Governor Inslee's proposals uh, and the proposals of Challenge Seattle are really great. Uh, they are a drop in the bucket 
about uh, as to what we need to really be successful in in both the housing cost and affordability and the homelessness crisis that we're experiencing on the ground uh, across the region there is no neighborhood there is no resident there is no business that is not touched by this we all know that and I think that's the starting point for moving ahead in this conversation is just acknowledging that again and again and again. And I try to do that. And I know several of us do, you know, it, it, it there, there's no one that's not experiencing hardship in their neighborhood because of the, these issues. I also want to lift up the staff teams from the jurisdictions because they've supported the elected officials in a way that's different, I think, than a lot of the interjurisdictional work that I've seen in the 10 years that I've been doing this uh, and, and really help us see how we can fit politics into the law, how we can fit politics into the funding that's available and help us see the gaps in the system, which I would say, you know, is closer to a system every single day, but still not the system that even our staff that are the experts in this field want to see for our community. And so my challenge to the RHC is to continue that work and continue that conversation. But then as elected officials, I just need to ask all of us to realize that how we behave and how we act and how we talk about this issue, both in our private lives, in our public lives, on social media and on email, is making the ability for our staff to get their job done exponentially harder every single day. And so I just need everyone to take a take a breath uh, and take a moment and look around and figure out if you're, uh, you know, working with working well with your colleagues and your neighbors. Uh, and if we're not, then we need to figure out how to do that better because our community demands it from us. Uh, and right now, as you will hear in a lot of the conversation this evening, you know, our, our folks that are working for us, our paid professionals are really struggling with our with the division that is kind of manifesting amongst the local elected officials and so uh, we got to do better and so i just want to say that as i uh, run this election where i will not be running for chair uh, because i'm excited to take the next step in this organization and 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 hopefully pass it on uh, to one of our other co-founders uh, so so i'm, I'm going to stop at that and and then go ahead and conduct this this election uh, so I'll start with the chair. Oh, and then just to let you know that we talked about this at the planning committee, that we, um, the, the rules, our, our interlocal agreement says we will um, conduct this election annually. It doesn't say when. And so we're just interpreting that that means at the beginning of the year uh, and that this will mean that the new, if there's new chair or vice chair, that they would take, uh, can take the, the, the reins at the next meeting rather than handing it off in the middle of the meeting. So if anybody has uh, any different interpretation or, or desire, please speak up now. Otherwise, I'll move into the nominations for chair. <clears throat> okay. Um, so I'm going to open nominations for the chair and ask if there are any nominations for the chair of the Regional Housing Council. And without even taking a breath, I'd like to nominate Carolyn Cox as the next chair of the Regional Housing Council. Are there any other nominations? Are there any other nominations? And are there any other nominations? Hearing none, all in favor of Councilmember Cox from the City of Lacey uh, being the chair of the Regional Housing Council starting at the February meeting, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Carolyn, congratulations. And I, I can't think of a better person. I, I'm really excited for your leadership and to see where you take us. Well, thank you so much. And thank you all for your confidence in me. I, I think anybody who knows me well knows that, you know, two things about how I roll here is I strongly believe in regional cooperation. And that's something I've worked very hard toward during my last term on the city council and communication. And I think, you know, echoing some of what Jim said today, I think it's really important um, in these times where nerves are beyond frayed with the pandemic, with everything that's coming at us, that we all give each other grace 
and cover where it's needed and uh, that we commit to working together as a team. So thank you all again and I'll turn it back to Jim. Thank you, Carolyn. And, and I guess, so I should have said at the beginning uh, for as another note for our new members, our rules also require that the chair or the vice chair of the regional housing council come from the, the administrative or the fiscal sponsoring organization, which in this case is Thurston County. And so that leaves us one person that's eligible to be nominated for vice chair, and that is uh, Commissioner Carolina Mejia. So uh, Carolina, are you willing to accept? Yes. Okay. Uh, are there any further nominations? Are there any further nominations? Are there any further nominations? All those in favor of Carolina Mejia uh, remaining the vice chair of the Regional Housing Council, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Congratulations, Carolina. Thank you. It was hard competition. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Uh, so that's going to um, take us quickly into a uh, scattered site project status update, and we're going to hear from Keely Marino. And also, could we have Ty Gundell um, promoted to the panelist? Yes. <laughs> And as as Ty is coming in, uh, there was an email uh, just about a half hour, an hour before this meeting with supporting documents for this agenda item. Keely. All right. Um, as uh, we are all from, or many of us are familiar. So a really quick overview in um, 2020 in the fall um, in lieu of not being able to um, find an adequate safe parking um, solution for those along Ensign Road at the time, we pivoted to start pitching an idea of a scattered site pilot project where an agency would be identified through RFP to provide intensive case management and site maintenance, or not site maintenance, but site governance at three um, encampments within the city of Olympia in partnership with city of Olympia to be providing the um, solid waste removal and hygiene and site maintenance. Um, so that um, passed after several months of um, process and um, only mutual aid partners or only MAP was our successful candidate for the scattered site pilot project on the intensive case management and site governance side. And they began to work in earnest in July um, to pr provide that support to those three encampments. And so um, as per our, uh, it being a pilot program and also per our um, agreement in moving forward with this, um, we have a six month um, check-in essentially for how are things going, a progress report, if you will, how are things going with the scattered site pilot project data, um, successes, things that um, have been challenges and what it looks like moving forward. And so um, without um, further ado, um, oh, uh-oh, we have uh, some internet issues looks like from, from Ty, I just got a text. So it does look like you're frozen indeed. Um, do you wanna back out and come back in? Okay, so they will back out and come back in and we'll begin. Okay, one minute they say. So we're intended to, we're intending to um, start with only map walking through the scattered site and the data in your packet. You will find um, a rundown of like what the, how the program operates. What is the philosophy of, of um, the scattered site pilot project? Um, why, uh, what is the research around why it works? Um, what is the rationale around the approach that only map presented? Um, and then specifically um, data points of how many people they've worked with, how many people in case management, how many referrals, what kind of referrals and breaks it down um, pretty thoroughly in that, in that report. So hopefully they will be coming back in a moment. I kind of wonder if Kelly should boot her so that, or boot Ty so that they come back, can get back in. Chair Cooper, I'm waiting for them to rejoin the uh, attendee list. I'm a little afraid of booting them. I don't want to block them out, but I will certainly give it a try.
There we go. Unstuck. <laughs> So the two people who will be presenting hopefully um, are Ty Gundell and Jenny Milchenko, and they will be able to give you a better introduction of exactly what their roles are within their team and will be able to present. Hopefully. Uh oh, dang it. Anyone have a joke? Here's one for all ages. Okay. Why was the strawberry sad? Why? Because it was in a jam. <laughs> right. <laughs> oh, I. Uh, Ty says that um, our internet is working, but it won't let us rejoin. I will work with uh, Zoom to get them a new link. I'll add her as a panelist. Okay. Do you want to flip flop Keely and just go to the next item and then come back? Yeah, that's a good idea. Okay, cool. Great. Okay, so then we're going to go to Tom. Um, Tom is going to talk to us about the 2022 request for proposals timeline. All right. Uh, good evening, everyone. So I'm going to share my screen. Um, and you some of this information was in your was in your packet. Um, and I'm actually going to pull up a, a different item here to talk a little bit about our, our RFP and our funding available for 2022. Um, as a refresher, last year for 2021, we had a pretty substantial RFP or request for proposal process. And most of the funds you awarded last year were two year grants. They were an essentially one year grants with an option for a second renewal year. And later this year, probably in March, we'll come back with you with a request to renew um, those those grants for a, for a second year. So we have a smaller RFP process this year. Um, so I'm gonna walk through this fairly quickly, but happy to go back and answer any questions. We did talk about this at the RFP, the funding work group has worked through this. And so what I'm really bringing to you um, with one minor exception is the recommendations from the funding work group um, who has walked through all of this. Um, so the first table we have here is just a, an overview of the funding sources that are available. This includes our, our federal and state and local dollars. And as you can see, um, we have some, the, the home federal program is something we want to RFP. This is for our capital dollars for affordable housing. I've listed the CDBG community development block grant programs. That's a separate process that is not under the RHC. Um, that is going to be um, with the South County this year, although we're in the process of negotiating an MOU between Lacey Tumwater and the South County on having a majority of those funds being going to housing activities. Um, but the South County will right. be receiving those funds this year. And then our 2060 local document recording fees will supplement our um, home funds for, for capital projects. We have our state CHG and HEN funds. Those are two year um, awards. And so there's not a need to, to recompete those funds this year. Our 2163 um, homeless services dollars most of the funds that you awarded last year um, will be renewed for a second year. However, um, we are recommending $400,000 um, for cold and hazardous weather um, to RFP. Last year, because of Unity Commons was not being constructed um, for cold and hazardous weather, we did the cold and hazardous weather contract as a one-year contract um, rather than two years. Um, our, our human services fund, our local sales tax, um, this is the other item wanted to bring up that was a little different from the funding work group is thanks to all the jurisdictions who've gotten their revenue collections from 2020. So to let us know your contribution. So the total HSF funding this year will be $291,041, which is $18,420 more than we collected last year. Um, so I have a recommendation for this group on how to allocate the, that additional $18,000, but those were all two year contracts as well. Um, and then we have our new document recording fee, 1277, but we don't know what that amount is yet for, from commerce. And so we also have a recommendation to hold off on awarding those funds because we don't know how much we're gonna be receiving and we don't know the exact eligible uses of those funds yet. Um, 
I've listed for the basic needs, just a, a reminder of what the basic needs awards were from last year that will be rolled over. Um, next, kind of the set aside. So under the 2163 document recording fees, in addition to putting out um, a majority of that funds for, for proposals, we do set aside some funds for specific activities. Um, so those include our coordinated entry system, housing basic needs, those are both two year contracts. So those will continue, those funds will not um, need to be RFP'd. Um, and then we have our cold and hazardous weather. So last year we set aside $250,000. This year we're recommending setting aside $400,000 for cold and hazardous weather activities. The other ones that are continued that are one year that get renewed on an annual basis are for our point in time count, um, an emergency fund of $200,000 uh, for our homeless coordinator, and then last year, recall, you set aside $150,000 for racial equity technical assistance. That RFP has actually been, is out. We have applications in, but because we're not renewing that for another year, we have since moved that $150,000 into the cold and hazardous weather set aside to increase money for cold and hazardous weather for, for next year. So that was the recommendation from the, the, the funding work group to move those funds or to to increase the cold and hazardous weather amount. Um, so our proposed schedule this year um, is to issue an RFP um, in end of February, um, February 25th. So we'll give you one last chance on February 23rd to make any last minute changes, but, but hopefully there won't be any because we're gonna issue the RFP on the 25th. Hold a bidders conference with applications due April 1st, um, and then have a, a review process with final funding recommendations made in May. Um, this is all de dependent on, as a county, we need to submit our annual action plan to HUD by July, and there needs to be a 30-day public comment period. So we need to have this process completed by early June, so we can complete that annual action plan and have a 30-day public comment period. Um, next, kind of moving through this quickly on the capital pipeline process. Um, so this was written a little before yesterday's events at the, at the county, so um, didn't want to kind of get our heart of ourselves. But um, with, the, with the enactment of a countywide home fund, I think that um, we want to make sure this matches up with the pipeline process that this group has been working on for the last couple of years. So I think there's some additional conversation and wanted to hold off on issuing a request for information for future capital projects until we had a better understanding of what a county home fund would look like and the, the development of a community advisory board to oversee that home fund. So putting a, a bit of a hold on the pipeline process until um, the county home fund can be incorporated um, into, into that um, process. Um, and then, as I mentioned, the 1277 funds, we're waiting um, to get additional guidance from Commerce. We expect to get this guidance probably in March or April, early April, in terms of how much funding, additional funding we expect to receive as a county, and what will be the eligible uses for those funds. We have some broad guidelines that are in the legislation, but Commerce is going through a process to narrow and define and clarify what eligible uses will be. So what we're recommending is this process of once we have that, um, that guidance is coming back to this group in, in April um, to make some recommendations around funding priorities after gaining input from the housing action team, um, after they have an opportunity to digest what those eligible activities are, um, get their input and then come to this group with, with the hope of issuing an RFP in May um, with applications due in mid-June with those. And then we need to submit those um, intended projects to fund back to commerce in, in July. So we think that we'll have be able to have contracts in place you know, by fall of 2022 with those funds. So it means having two RFP processes this year, which is, which is not ideal, um, but we're not quite ready to go in February and we don't wanna hold on to those funds until next February um, as well before we issue them. So. That is the recommendation is to do a second RFP. Um, this all depends a little bit on the timing of when we exactly get those, actually get those recommendations um, and guidance from Commerce and we know how much money to spend. Um, so what we're requesting tonight for you is to approve the set asides for 2022 um, and then to approve issuing an RFP for cold and hazardous weather and for capital projects. So there are two projects in the pipeline currently 
um, that are scheduled to be funded this year. Um, so recommended an, an issuing an RFP um, to fund those capital projects. And then the recommendation for the additional human services fund for that additional $18,000 is to distribute those funds on a proportional basis to the existing um, awards. So it would be a slight increase for all of those applicants for their second for their second year of grant funds to see an appropriate way rather than issuing an RFP for for just eighteen thousand dollars is to um, kind of provide that to the existing applicants. So that is I walk through that very quickly, um, but I'm happy to answer any questions and have more discussion on any of those topics that are that people would like to talk about. Yeah, so questions for Tom, go ahead, and then we'll, I think I'll take these each separately. Michael. Um, I, I guess this is sort of less about this plan and more about specifically what constitutes hazardous weather. Does that, is, is that not just cold? Is that also for when we got ma a massive heat wave last summer? Um, does the hazardous weather, so would funding for that or the RFP for that also account for resources that are needed if we ever hit, you know, 110 degrees again during the summertime? Yes, it certainly does. And so um, we just, we clearly, we intentionally distinguished hazardous weather because hazardous weather could happen throughout the year, whether right. that's smoke season or heat um, or cold. And so, yes, it is specifically intended for those kind of any a severe weather event that, that impacts people. It does require a declaration by the public health officer as a, as a hazardous weather event. Um, so there's some criteria, it's very specific, um, but it, it can be for those, those types of events as well. And, and smog too, when we, yeah. if, if we got the high, you know, 300 particulate count or whatever. Yeah, and Keeley might know specifically, but yes, it is based on a particulate count and an extremely unhazardous uh, weather or air air quality yeah the hazardous okay. the hazardous weather is year round um so that those contracts can be enacted when there's a declaration at any point point. and so in 2019 we worked with a uh, dr wood who was our public health officer at the time and created a threshold for particulate matter for smog and smoky air so um that that's the intent yeah and i'll just add because it's a good education moment that the air agencies in Washington are planning to drop the Washington Air Quality Index because it's been be, become so confusing with the federal air quality yeah. index uh, because of those smoke events. So um, it, if not this year, next year, we'll only have one, one measure for that in our state. Okay, any other questions for Tom? Okay, so Tom, the first request is this set aside chart. Okay. Yes, that's correct. Okay, so can you just go back there so it's in front of us while we. So I'm looking for either a motion or, or discussion around the set aside recommendations from the funding subcommittee. Again, I'm looking for a motion or discussion. Um, I'll, I'll move to approve the proposed 2163 set of slides for 2022. I'll second. Okay. <laughs> Was that a question? No, just a second. Okay. So I have a motion and a second. Andy, you unmuted. Is there something there? Or are you just trying to help? Okay, got it. Okay. Any further discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Okay, Tom, you have direction there. The next is the uh, to issue the RFP for cold and hazardous weather and those capital projects. Uh, this is Michael. I, I move that we approve issuing the RFP for cold and hazardous weather and capital projects as presented. This is Carolyn. I'll second. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Any further discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Great. And then just, just for my own benefit, Tom, 
the those capital projects will be just based on the the current projects that are in the pipeline and then once we have the the community advisory board set up they will help us wrestle with how to establish a new pipeline with all of the capital funding sources in one place does that is that correct that is correct um i will say that any organization is able to apply under the rfp those funds um in a sense the, the, the two projects have been identified as priority. There's no additional funding that will be going to those those projects, but um, you are correct. Great. And how just for for everyone's benefit, Tom, how long do we have before our next wave of funding to really get that body of work done? Um, which wave of the of capital? Of capital. So um, I think, well, I'm not sure about the, the home fund of when that's, that money comes in. We have 1406, we've so committed in a sense for the next two years of 1406 money, um, but it will really be for, for next year um, for um, additional capital projects. So we get the, the home and 2060 money we allocate annually. Okay. Okay, thank you, that's helpful. Okay, and then we have one other item here, which is to approve the distribution of 18,420 in additional HSF funds to existing 2021 contracts on a prorational, proportional basis. Is there a motion? This is Carolyn. I'll, I'll move to approve distribution of the $18,420 and additional HSF funds to existing 2021 contracts on a proportional basis. I think that's a good use of that money and simplifies things enormously as a veteran of the RFP group. There's... I'll second, this is Michael. Okay, so we have a motion and a second. And then just to point out that Tom is showing us on the screen who those current uh, contractees are, right, Tom? Correct. Okay, any further discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries, thank you. Okay, Tom, thank, thank you. you, that was a lot, appreciate it. Thanks for keeping us moving in that world. Okay, so now we're gonna go back to Keeley and see if we got through our technical difficulties. All right, we're working on it right now. So if anyone doesn't know, Interfaith Works, Olympia Free Clinic, and Olympia Mutual Aid Partners all work out of the same office up on, uh, at uh, United Churches, and they have wretched Wi-Fi that they all share. And so that is where they are. <clears throat> and so they've emailed me their PowerPoint presentation. They're going to try to call in on their phone because they're just having a, a horrible time with their internet. Um, Maybe we can fundraise for a better internet at that church because <laughs> so many agencies are using it. Um, so I have the PowerPoint and I'm just waiting for them to call in from their phone. And if, if that is taking a, uh, too much time, we can maybe move on to the updates on the... Let's go ahead until we see them and keep moving through the agenda. So I'm gonna just okay. either, I'll keep an eye out in the chat or on my screen. So if it looks like I'm going too far ahead and they're already here, let me know, Keely, okay? Perfect, yeah, sounds okay. good. Um, Cause I wanna get to the the thing of the of the day, which is is the exciting part of to, of this week uh, from, from our perspective. And so uh, we're gonna move now to the um, technical team working group updates, uh, which is Keely and Tom. But I'm gonna just take a, a second of privilege and ask if Commissioner Mejia will tell us the exciting news. Uh, sure, yes, I'd be honored. Um, one second, sorry. Um, this, is, this is what it's all about, Carolina, that's fine. Yeah. <laughs> um, so yesterday, um, you know, in a two to one vote, uh, the commissioners uh, passed the home fund ordinance and so we are all very happy. This was all, you know, oh, something that, ooh, I, I, 
I see Ty come. Go ahead on. and keep going. Um, uh, we were all very excited. We worked very hard on, you know, with the other jurisdictions to make sure that it was something that everyone was happy with and that everyone was in agreement with. And so I think the product of it uh, came out very well, um, very well thought out. And so um, we're all very excited to continue on and, and, and working and, um, you know, hopefully funding more projects that are, <laughs> that have been pending for a long time. Cool. Well, thank you to the Board of County Commissioners. We really, really appreciate it. And we appreciate you hearing us when we ask and, and all of the community members that have been asking for you for this for a long time. So thank you. Yeah, no, thank you. Uh, thank you to the RHC and to all its members. Really, we wouldn't have been able to uh, cross this, you know, um, make this across the finish line if it weren't for all of your hard work and dedication on this as well. So thank you. Thank you. Well, and that makes a whole bunch more work for us. So uh, that's that's why we do this, right? So I'm gonna go ahead and have Tom and Keely are gonna give us updates both around uh, the Home Fund, Next Steps, and our RFP for the Diversity and Equity and Inclusion Consultant. I'll go. All right, so <laughs> we did our um, RFP for the diversion or diversion for diversity, equity, and inclusive inclusion consultant for the homeless crisis response system. That application process closed on the 14th of January. We received two applications. Um, we developed a, a review panel in a, in a different way for this particular RFP where we asked agencies to consider putting forth one of their staff members that may have lived experience or who are um, black indigenous or a person of color to come to the review panel, especially if they're doing frontline work to, to develop the scoring process as well as to score those projects. So I, I and Tom will be there for the, for the review panel discussion of how they're moving forward. However, we're not voting, we're not scoring. It will be entirely this review panel. Um, so we're very excited. It's a new process, uh, familiar, but new. And we should know, hopefully by the end of this week, who our consultant will be. So looking really forward to that process. Thanks for breaking the structure and trying to do it different. Yeah, absolutely. Any questions for Keely on that? Okay, Tom or Romero on Home Fund? Uh, I don't have um, anything else on the home fund. I think, um, as folks knows, within the ordinance, there are some next steps. Um, Keely and I will be meeting with Ramiro to start thinking about what those next steps are. And, and kind of, I think we'll have more information for the RHC probably next month on those next steps. But I look to Ramiro if there's anything you want to add at this point. But I, I know there's some next steps that we um, need to figure out. And we've got our work laid out for us. Um, good afternoon. Thank you for um, <clears throat> giving me the floor. Yeah, I shared the uh, uh, <clears throat> the excitement of the board passing this particular ordinance and the home fund. And uh, if you have not seen the ordinance, it's very prescriptive as to what um, uh, this particular fund is going to do, as well as how the regional housing council and all the members within will take will play a key role as to how the funds will be. Um, uh, used in the future. Uh, there's a, a few steps that uh, on this ordinance that a board of county commissioners have asked me to do, so which involves a, uh, a new local agreement with the city of Olympia as to how we can combine the funds. And also uh, working with the participating jurisdictions, all of you, and open up the uh, in local agreement related to the regional housing council because the Regional Housing Council has and plays a key role, again, on, on providing suggestions and recommendations to the Board of County Commissioners as to how the home fund uh, should be utilized at the regional level. <clears throat> there is a couple of things. Um, this, uh, we're gonna be submitting the, uh, the ordinance to the Department of Revenue. And I believe the first date that we can probably start seeing that assessment will be July 1st. Um, uh, according to the uh, Department of Revenue guidelines in, in, in the statute. And um, so there um, more to come on this. The only suggestion that I have, uh, Mr. Chair, 
is uh, on the upcoming item, uh, the HAD in, in RHC retreat. Um, I think uh, it will be an opportunity to see how the Regional Housing Council have a conversation on the home fund. Um, because I believe the, the, uh, based on this, the structure of the Regional Housing Council will change. Uh, we need to have a conversation as to how the executive arm, or as I call them, the resolution, is going to play a role with the elected officials uh, that form the Regional Housing Council. Um, I don't want to diminish the, the, the value and the opportunity to have a conversation with the uh, House and Action team. I think that is something that we need to continue to work on that. But I may suggest to take the time to really start working on the, on the structure of the, of the uh, at least the ideas of the Regional Housing Council. The subcommittee, uh, the, uh, uh, of, um, the citizen subcommittee that needs to be part of this, as well as how, again, the executive, the, the executive arm of the regional housing council, how that is, is going to play out. Uh, that may be a good opportunity to have a conversation among yourselves, among all this group, and then start forming the idea as to how this new and local agreement should be uh, put together. Food for thought. Great update. That's that's the kind of stuff I was hoping you would say. And that's exactly what Carolyn and I talked about when we met at lunch around just talking about ideas for the retreat. It's we were already talk, already going to talk about our structure and now we're really going to talk about our structure. So um, I think that's that's good. So any questions about the home fund before we move to the um, the next item? Andy. Yeah, I just uh, obviously this is a very exciting time. Um, uh, a lot has happened really between December and until this meeting. And uh, luckily we've had the chance for the, to the three cities uh, to at least be uh, the, met, the leadership of the three cities, our three cities meeting um, in December. And again, last Friday, um, have this topic be our, our really our sole discussion. And we, so we have started talking about what the uh, updated our local agreement will, will look like and there's been quite a big conversation about this even getting to the point um, where all the jurisdictions are really feel like we're on the same page at least from the the leadership standpoint of, of the next steps of how the rhc is going to look at and um, deploy these funds and there's a, a couple of things that we talked about was really some fundamental structural changes that's going to maybe you know come to the rhc with um, independent staff, um, like a program manager type, executive director type level staff to, that's really going to take the RHC um, and all everything the RHC has been doing and really have 100% dedicated staff for it. We really feel like that was a really important next step. Um, so there's been like two like parallel processes going on. And we've, we've had the, the mayors, the deputy mayors and the County manager and city managers all talking up to this point, and then there's the RHC who needs to, you know, have conversations as, as well. Um, I do think it's a great opportunity for the, uh, the for the retreat for all these ideas to come together and have some some sort of agreement on. And I, I really do feel like we're we're pretty close all, already with just with us, some discussions that we have happened up to this point. Um, but it's, I think it will be really important that we get the retreat right, that we have good support staff at the retreat, that we can really talk through um, what the RHC is going to look like going forward. And um, we've also had some discussions at the, at the three cities, the, you know, the mayor's deputy, deputy mayor, uh, mayor pro tem level about uh, looking at, you know, basic, you know, policy that goes around this issue as well. Up until now, the RHC really hasn't gone into the, the policy side of, of things too much. But now with these additional funds coming and really this have an opportunity of having a, a truly regional model that's gonna, that's gonna, I think, be the example um, for other communities going forward as well. How this communication, everything works together. I think it's really important that you, you don't forget the policy side of things. And we, were, we just had a conversation about you know, there's other people doing some really good work on this issue. Uh, former Governor Gregoire has, you know, obviously put a lot of time and effort, and I think we can have some agreement around her, some of the policy things that she's talked about. 
as well. And so maybe there's an opportunity for even uh, hopefully former Governor Graveyard to maybe come to the retreat if we can make that happen and, and, and kick us off in the right direction as well. So um, it's an exciting time uh, for the region. I'm really thankful for the uh, county um, in the city of Olympia to agree really on that a, it makes sense for us all to be working together on this and it doesn't make sense to have separate funds and separate you know jurisdictions doing different things so um, I'm really looking forward for us to you know come together and and have a really good solid retreat and and really put the RHC on the right on the right path and I say that my my iPad's about to die and I have to find a <laughs> I'm gonna have to find a, uh, something to plug it in. Great, thank you. Okay, let's go back to our um, other item because I see Ty here. Uh, so Keely, just kind of keeping an eye on the clock. We, I think really have this and the retreat conversation, which will take a few minutes today. So kind of maybe, maybe 10, 15 minutes. All right, so, um... Ty, are you all there? Yes, we're here. Okay. Um, so I'm going to be running the the, um, the slides for them just because I did, I told them of the travails of, of the internet at where your office is. Um, so I will share screen and then you guys can take off. And then um, Kelly, I did see Brian Hess in the um, participants if we wanna promote. Thank him. you, Keely, I just promoted him. Perfect, thank you. All right, thank you, Keely, and thank you everybody for bearing with us through the all the internet challenges. So, um, going ahead, sorry, my name is Ty Guntel, I use she, her pronouns, and I'm the program coordinator for OliMap, and I'm here with... My name is Jenny Milchenko, I use she or they pronouns, and I'm the quality assurance and data analyst person for OliMap. And just want to start with saying that we're really thankful to be able to have the opportunity to talk with you all tonight about um, some of the successes, challenges, and the lessons that we've learned through the first six months of this project. So thank you for having us. And Keely, if you can move to the next slide. We... Uh, this is Google Slides. Do I just... There yeah. we go. Got it. Got it. <laughs> Great, thank you. Um, so we wanted to start with just doing a little bit of background that Keeley started out. But as you all know, uh, the pilot project really came about in response to the reality that we do not have sufficient availability of housing or shelter options in our community. And as a result, we've seen continued increases in the number of people surviving unsheltered and unsanctioned camp, commun com camp communities. Um, and then, of course, in connection to that, we've seen escalating impacts across the county in relation to those camp communities. Uh, the historical response to that has to address those challenges has often been to uh, displace folks from those camps without necessarily having other options for where folks can go. Um, and so with that context in mind, one of the main intentions behind the Scattered Site Pilot Project was really to pilot an alternative and more effective humane response to unsheltered homelessness and also to pilot more effective methods of mitigating the harms and impacts associated with camp communities. Um, also, just that the Scattered Site program is really centered in what we often refer to as a shelter in place approach to camp communities, which essentially means working closely with the people living at the camps to improve safety, stability, health, where people are and when there is an absence of more appropriate and ideal shelter or housing options. And so we were, uh, Keely, if you can move, great, thank you. Um, so we were contracted with Thurston County to start our part of the pilot project um, in June of 2021. Um, and our focus was to provide case management, site support, and collective management services through the project. Um, the city of Olympia was contracted to carry out the site maintenance part with a focus on garbage and waste maintenance. Again, with the overall goal being to really improve camp stability, health, safety and connection to social services for the folks living at the sites we are working with. 
And the proposal that we put together for the program that we were contracted to carry out um, was really informed by one, a lot of other uh, regional examples of similar programs, both in Seattle and also local examples like Coyote Village and New Hope Village, um, but also our own experience working with unsanctioned camp communities in the area over the last few years, particularly the Nickerson camp, um, which is one of the communities along Wheeler Avenue that we work with which we've been supporting with this approach since summer of 2018. So when we were contracted to work with the site, we were contracted to work with three specific camp communities, um, those that were formerly located along Deschutes Parkway, who are mostly now um, at staying at a, a couple hotels in the area, and also those that are still currently living along Ensign Road and Wheeler Avenue. And since the start of the project, um, there were roughly 175 to 200 people um, living among those three camp communities. And then just to give you all a better understanding of how we've been providing services on a day-to-day -day basis, uh, since the start, we've really relied on like a team-based outreach approach to supporting folks at these sites, which has meant assigning three of our workers um, to each site, including two case managers who are able to focus on connecting folks to services and also provide intensive outreach-based case management, as well as one site support worker whose primary role is really to work with the camp community as a whole and stakeholders to improve site stability, health, and safety. And so with that, I'm going to turn it over to Jenny, who's going to talk with you all about some of the outcomes we've seen from our case management program so far. Yeah, thanks, Ty. So uh, overall, since the beginning of our project, we have worked with about 180 individuals, which, um, as Ty said, there were estimated 175 to 200. So Luckily, we have been able to work even just at a small capacity with a majority of the folks who are living unsheltered. So um, as you can see, uh, the former Deschutes Parkway was the encampment where the most residents were, but also where we had the most interaction with residents. And for Ensign Road, 49 folks and Nickerson Wheeler, uh, 45. Great. So um, I'm just going to share a little bit specifically about what our mobile case management program looks like, as well as some of our preliminary data that we've collected from the first six months of the program. Next slide, please. So um, our case management program is a little bit different from other programs in a couple other ways. So as the name infers, we are mobile in that we do everything completely outreach based. All of our appointments happen on site and case managers meet people where they are figuratively and literally. We usually will set up a canopy on site where people come to do case management, but you can also find folks sitting on the steps of RVs at Ensign doing case management, sitting on the back of a car at Wheeler. It's really whatever best meets the needs of the participant. Um, we can also work with any demographic. The funding is pretty open. We don't have a particular you know, group of people we're limited to, so it's kind of open to everybody. And then we are also an extremely low barrier program. The only requirements we have to engage in case management is to be a resident of one of the scattered sites, um, be willing to work on goals equally with uh, Olympia an only map caseworker. And because the demand for case management is so high, we don't actually have enough caseworkers to meet the goal and there's a, there's a wait list for every campsite. So we do have to use prioritization and we base that on an individual's vulnerability and other risk factors. So as a general overview, we have provided case management to over 65 people on the scattered site program. Um, as of December, that was the last time that we had checked in and I got a head count for everyone in case management. We had 63 people enrolled. Um, the majority or the highest number was from the former Deschutes encampment, uh, followed by Ensign with 20 people and the Nickerson Wheeler encampment with 15. So um, one of the things we were tracking as a deliverable was just service referrals. And essentially we were defining a referral as just anytime one of our workers referred a resident to any kind of external service to Olimap. So as you can see from the graph, numerically, we had about 248 referrals between July and now, which is quite a bit. Um, the most referrals of 50% approximately all came from the Deschutes encampment. So our workers there were all about connecting people to resources. Um, Ensign Road 52 and Nickerson Wheeler 72. 
you can see from the graph that the three most common like types or category of referrals people requested was referrals for housing and for medical care and for basic care or hygiene. And I think you'll see a little bit more repeated in further data, but you know, meeting basic needs like hygiene, housing, and medical stuff is really like the number one thing that people want to work on and need to work on before they're able to address those higher level needs. So another thing we tracked was applications. So it's pretty general, any kind of application, whether that be like SSI, food stamps, unemployment, insurance, basically any anything you have to work through and do an application for. So overall, we did 112 of those with folks. And again, Deschutes is the encampment where we did have the highest amount of applications followed by um, Wheeler and then Ensign. I'm not gonna read everything off, but I would like to point out at this point that you can see that phones, were one of the biggest things that people needed to apply for. There is a service where people can get a free phone and having a phone is, if not one of the most important things that we help people with first, because it's like the first thing that helps them get connected and stay connected to services. Uh, and then you can see after that, it was identification and housing. So very similar to referrals, like it really shows like these basic needs are really the things that people need addressed first. We also have another program that's kind of part of case management, but also site support workers can do it. It's called basic connections, which is similar to case management, but not everybody wants to necessarily engage with case management on a consistent basis. So we have a less intensive option that's more so meant for like simple processes that don't require multiple appointments or complex follow up. And out of those, we have had 63 folks sign up for basic connection services. And again, a vast majority of those has to do with phones and IDs. And if you are wondering why IDs are such a big deal, in, in case you don't know, um, you basically need an ID to get access or apply to anything. So it is literally like the first thing that people often need to do before they're able to do anything else. So I'm gonna hand it back over to Ty to talk a little more about specifically site support and collective management. Thank you, Jenny. And Keely, you can go to the next slide. Thank you. Um, so as I mentioned earlier, our site support and collective management program is informed by both other regional projects and our own experience providing this type of support. So the main goal of this approach is to work with residents in the camp communities and the surrounding community to improve general stability, health and well-being and quality of life at the site. And of course, to help mitigate some of the broader community impacts associated with camp communities. A really, really critical part of this is working to improve relationships between camp residents, the surrounding neighborhoods, the neighbors and other stakeholders. And we do this by trying to support ex expanded communication, collaboration and problem solving around shared challenges. I also just want to take a moment to share a little bit more about what collective management is and likely the part of our program that most folks are unfamiliar with. So you, when we're using a collective management model, we are supporting camp community residents in democratically developing and implementing vision, values, community agreements, and community processes that are intended to help them better manage um, challenges that come up with living at a camp community. So non-resident staff like ourselves assist with facilitating this process and support the operations. And self-governance, um, which is a critical part of collective management, really is just one part of what collective management is. For us, uh, a collective management model also really requires facilitation support from non-resident staff like ourselves and the support of communication um, and the support communication and often the participation of other uh, stakeholders like landowners, neighbors, um, and jurisdictional partners. And this is here we this is included in the informational packet that was sent to you all but just to give a better idea of what the process typically looks like. It typically takes up anywhere from nine to 12 months to go through the process of fully working with a, a new camp community to go through the process of developing and implementing a collective management process and that usually really starts with the need for relationship building and getting a really good sense of what the basic needs safety needs um, strengths and weaknesses are 
are of a camp. And then from there, working with the residents and partners to develop community processes. And once that has been developed, supporting those folks and implementing the processes that they come up with. And there's a lot of factors that do um, impact this timeline. Um, and it's a big one with those being um, site control, uh, the size of a camp and the general stability of the camp when we first start working with the site. So some of the um, basic conditions necessary for collective management to work include partnership and collaboration with neighbors, stakeholders, and community partners. Um, as much stability as can possibly be built at the camp is really essential for it to, to be successful. Um, openness to creative and resourceful solutions, and also some element of site control, or at the very least, the ability to limit interference with the collective management process. And the outcomes that we usually um, see when we go through a collective management process with the camp. Um, some of those outcomes are weekly camp community meetings and also the development of community guidelines, resident expectations, expectations and accountability, admission, expulsion processes, and decision-making processes. And last thing, just to give a quick example, um, just to really help paint a picture of what a collective management model can look like. Um, the Nickerson encampment, as mentioned earlier, is a camp of about 20 folks that live along Wheeler Avenue. And we've been working with them using a collective management model since 2018. Um, this is a camp that not only where the residents have all access to micro shelters or other hard walled structures, they also have um, a formal admissions of process that they've been using for years, along with accountability processes, expulsion processes, processes, um, and they've been hosting weekly camp meetings regularly weekly for over, over three years now. This is also a site that where all the residents now have access to laundry, water, garbage, removal, restrooms, um, and access to shower facilities thanks to work um, with a lot of our partners and some of the things that we've been able to connect folks with. And while everyone um, understands that, you know, this is a site that there's absolutely still room for improvement. It's not, um, it's not as if this is a site that never has any challenges, but it is relatively the cleanest, most organized, stable, and safe unsanctioned, unsanctioned camp in Thurston County. And Keely, you can skip this next slide and go straight um, past the, there we go. So I'm gonna turn it back over to Jenny to talk about just some of the challenges that we have come up against over the first uh, six months of the program. Totally, thanks. So let us go to the next slide. Oh, you're there, Kelly. Okay, cool. So the first um, challenge that we've come across so far with this project is um, a crisis driven approach. So unfortunately, we all know that there's been a lot of moving pieces with the county and there's kind of a lot of like having to make decisions very quickly. And unfortunately, often that um, will leave lead to lack of a long term goal or plan and very rarely allows for all of us um, to come together in this project to make decisions collectively. Um, crisis driven decisions often don't take into account unintentional consequences of our quick decisions or actions. And um, because there's so many factors that have been outside of our control, we have had to constantly navigate, uh, respond to and mitigate um, pretty high levels of not just individual crisis, but also camp wide crisis, which brings us to the second uh, barrier, which is sweeps and displacement. So just so you understand how we define sweeps, we define sweep as any sort of displacement of an unhoused community when there's no appropriate or legal alternative location for people to be moved to. Uh, because of the full sweep of Deschutes, which happened in December, and the partial sweep of Upper Ensign, which was in December and January, unfortunately, over half of the participants that we've been working with for the past six months have been displaced. Um, as you may or may not know, a lot of them or some of them are temporarily staying in hotels via the funding from the city and the county, uh, but many folks were unfortunately scattered and we no longer know where they are or how to contact them. So even, even with the hotels, um, an exit date is nearing and we'll likely have another 40 folks just kind of leaving and not really knowing where to go. So uh, the next barrier with conflicting goals and expectations and roles. So a lot of the crises that we have experienced, we think is just probably not necessarily having the same goals or expectations for the project. 
Um, another one is lack of site control, like Ty mentioned, even though we're contracted to provide stability for these camps, we don't actually have any formal control or authority over decisions that are made regarding site operations or management. And it is kind of like having a shelter or a business and not really having the authority to make decisions on how the space runs or what the expectations are. And it's simply not really sustainable or efficient use of resources. And, you know, of course, the last one is staff burnout. We all know working in social services that it is exhausting, even when there are plenty of resources and staff. But with the situation now, the work has been extremely challenging and taxing on our staff. Um, everyone has worked incredibly hard to keep our program afloat. But, you know, everyone kind of has a limit and our staff are really exhausted and traumatized and honestly overwhelmed by the sheer amount of need that we've seen on a daily basis. And unfortunately, we haven't been really been able to provide adequate support for our staff, which has just kind of made everything worse. Next slide, thanks. Ty is gonna talk a little bit about future, future steps. Uh, and you can go to the next one, Keely. So yeah, there's definitely been um, a lot of really significant successes and positive outcomes of the project so far, especially related to case management and also really our ability to work with partners in the project to collaborate and mitigate or sometimes really prevent some of the additional harms that would have otherwise been caused like through these really intense crisis situations. Um, but we do have some thoughts and ideas that you know we would really love to be able to see um, moving forward um, through the remainder six months of the project, just both to ensure the success and also that the project remains like in alignment with the original expectations and, and goals. So just to quickly run through them, um, some of the things that we would like to prioritize moving forward is to work with our partners to build a more clear and shared understanding of the goals, strategies, and priorities of the project, um, strategizing for actionable steps to prevent continuance of a more crisis-driven approach, clearly delineating roles and expectations of project partners, more specifically with the site management aspect of the program, expanding partnerships. And with this, we really mean intentionally reaching out to build partnerships with folks like faith communities and other community partners with the intention of trying to create and develop other legal places for people and more appropriate places for people to stay. Um, we also really want to prioritize um, creating and implementing a more effective and consistent cleanliness and garbage removal process. Um, we would love to see more support um, for safety and sus sustainability for both Oli Map and City of Olympia program staff who have also been really um, overwhelmed dealing with all the, the high level of crisis that we've been dealing with. And then lastly, and honestly, we might see this as one of the most important ones is developing a more unified narrative about the project and um, more intentional public communication going forward. And with that, we'll close the presentation, but are happy to take questions. And as I heard Jim mention earlier, we also have that packet sent out that goes into a lot more detail of the stuff we went over tonight. Thank you for listening, everyone. Yeah. Thank you both. That was really informative. And just before I open it up, uh, your, your written document was really clear and easy to understand in a way to me that was super impressive for the age of your organization. So good job for to Thank all you, of you. Yeah. Really appreciate that. Um, okay, questions for Olimap. Keely, from a contracting perspective, how do we make their, how will their uh, suggestions uh, come a lot? That's a good question. I mean, we meet on a regular, on a weekly basis with the city of Olympia to continue just talking through um, the health and well-being of the pilot project. And I think this, th this part of the conversation, these recommendations can go to that weekly meeting and start working on implementing some of those suggestions. Cool. Yeah, and then if there's needs from the staff end of us around policy or financial considerations, you would bring that back? Oh, yes, definitely. Okay, cool. Uh, you know, just particularly for me, before I go to Keith, you know, because I'm, I'm killing dead air here. And I know if I do that very long, everyone will raise their hand. Um, but is is that, you know, we need to take care of those staff and we need to get them to a living wage first. Uh, so if there's an opportunity to make sure that we're doing a good job there uh, so that we're we're modeling uh, what we say, uh, that that's just my two cents. Keith. Yeah, thank, thank you, Chair Cooper. Uh, 
I just wanted to chime in that obviously the city of Olympia has been a partner here in the scattered site program. Uh, Darian did some research for me today just to find out how much garbage has we, have we actually picked up uh, as a result of this program or through this program. And we've moved 369 tons of garbage, which, you know, that's a lot of garbage. Uh, that's, that's a tremendous amount of garbage. We have uh, nearly exhausted our funds. We do have a contract with the county. I think we spend about 160,000 out of a total of 240,000. And there will, we've asked the county for some amendments to that contract to allow us to, to access the rest of those funds. We've also exhausted the funds associated with the, the provision of portable restrooms. Um, again, you know, portable restrooms are a really essential part of this program. Uh, and as we've gone through uh, some staffing changes at the city over the last three months uh, and have been chasing you know, quite a bit of crisis as, as Ty you know, clearly indicated, uh, our hope is to be fully staffed uh, here shortly and be in a much better position to partner with both the county and OLIMAP going forward and to really dig into the recommendations that were included in Ty's presentation because they, they do have merit. She and I met this morning and kind of talked through this and we're on the same page. Um, we just haven't been uh, as effective as we could have been or should have been just from a staffing and also a crisis management perspective. So more to come. Thank you for Thank that you addition, Keith. Anything else on scattered site? Well, and I think pilot is the right word, right? Like that's that's what we're doing. We're, we're learning as we go because there's not a lot of people that do this. Uh, and even some of the people that say they're doing it are just moving people along to other places and not going to the level of work that we're seeing here. So Tom, you were coming on on this. Yeah, I just wanted to kind of follow up on, on Keith's point. Um, the city has kind of reached out to us about making an amendment to their contract because of um, kind of the shifts that have happened over um, the last couple months of, of making some adjustments on the use of funds to their contract. So um, just want to kind of make everyone aware that um, the county, I'm inclined to kind of allow City of Olympia to kind of make those adjustments and amendments to be flexible. With these funds to, so funds are getting directed where they're most needed but just wanted to kind of be open and transparent with with this body as kind of there were some kind of budget line items originally in, in the contract and um, we'll be working with the city of olympia unless there's objections to kind of adjust funding as needed given kind of where the project is currently and what the need is great anything else on this okay well Keely, did you have something? I was just going to say, just for context, this agency was 100% volunteer until July 15th. And they've gone from a completely volunteer organization to um, handling over nearly a million dollars um, with their 1277 funds that are about to kick in. And, and they've gone from doing this project to now suddenly uh, having to shift gears multiple times. So I just want to appreciate and applaud their um, flexibility and just acknowledge that that's a lot for a brand new agency to go through in the first six months. And we have to be realistic when we have expectations of what they can do. Yeah. And I couldn't have said it better myself. So thanks for, for doing that. It's, it's an important comment to make and um, yeah, we just keep adapting and figuring out how to do it better. So thank you, Ty and Oli Matt. We really appreciate it. Thanks for having us. We really appreciate you guys listening. Thank you. Okay, so that takes us to uh, the HAT and RHC update, uh, retreat update. So um, a lot going on, a lot of moving parts uh, this week. And so wanted to, you know, just kind of recap uh, for folks who um, are new uh, and, and, and all of us where we are on this conversation and then have a, a recommendation about moving forward. So uh, my first question uh, to, the, to the RHC 
um, members is whether you're okay uh, with me continuing to lead with Carolyn on the retreat planning process uh, for continuity's sake. Um, I'm happy to do that, um, but I wanna make sure I'm following the direction of the body. Any, any objections? Okay, okay, and Carolyn and I will keep working on that with Keeley. Uh, and our plan, my you know, my hope is that after a couple of updates and us and a recommendation today, uh, that we can bring you a pretty firm uh, outline and timeline uh, next month. Um, so the first uh, the first thing I, I want to say is, you know, to to Andy's point, you know, there's a lot in front of us and there's a lot of conversation uh, that we need to we need to have. Uh, you know, Romero brought this up that we need to, you know, we need to figure out how to incorporate the home funds. You know how do those uh, how do those relate to our current committee structure? How does the housing action team and its subcommittees relate to the regional housing council? Uh, and and so there there is a body of work that we need to accomplish, uh, and it's not going to be possible to do it in four hours. And so I think that's the the thing that we all need to know is as we move through this conversation, there's going to be a a time commitment for us and for for the hat. And so I'm going to need everybody to be be real about that as we as we move ahead and, and look at look at how to schedule what I think is two different days that aren't back to back for scheduling reasons and maybe one full day and one half day is kind of what's in my gut but I want to get a contract in place with a consultant and have us lead have them lead us to the reality of that uh, you know before I get too much more firm um you know for the new folks you know, we've spent the last several months going out and, and I've done a roadshow with the, I think, five subcommittees of the housing action team, uh, including the affordable housing work group that includes, uh, the, you know, business and, and chamber members at the table. Uh, it's a really great place for them to engage that already exists and they have been playing in that role um, and just listening. What, what's going on? What do we need? You know, with the goal of at this retreat, how do we better the relationship between those entities? How do we use the existing structure of the housing action team, both for think tank and for policy development and maybe for funding recommendations? And, and how do we uh, you know, add in all of these other components that, that need to play with the, 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 the home fund, the, you know, the, the, the you know, Olympia's home fund and its advisory committee coming together to, to, to do something functionally in the same place. Um, so, so we have kind of really four, I think four big buckets that we need to wor work on at our retreat. And the, the first one is the, the kind of the, the main reason for coming together is what is our strategic vision or, you know, what's the place we're going towards in the next couple of years or five years? Uh, sort of the biggest picture possible. Um, what is the organizational structure and meeting uh, matrix of this new organization as it continues to evolve and grow? Um, what is the upstream stream work? You know, we all passed affordable housing plans and we have to figure out how to get upstream of this uh, crisis intervention that we're doing all day, every day. Um, you know, actually I had a great conversation with the private developer about that just yesterday, you know, and we don't have the money, we do not have the cash to meet even the, the next level of, um, of, you know, non, non-permanent support of affordable housing, if you will, that, that we need, uh, beyond the conversations in our current five-year plan. And then, and then also we have three major initiatives. So we have the um community solutions work around the mo uh, chronic homelessness and and that conversation uh that that we're going into uh, we have the next five-year plan that will come nearly right after this year uh and then we have the diversity equity and inclusion consultants and and just to say you know that's one place we've we've barely scratched the surface is inequity within our housing systems and inequity within our homeless you know, population. And, and so we have a lot of work to do there, not only to look at the people populations, but to look at how the climate crisis and the climate emergency relates so that we have climate justice and equity within our housing conversations. And right now, those things aren't connected. 
And so sort of within that, um, within those big initiatives, we have a lot of work to do. And so, would, you know, I know that's not inclusive of everyone. And so the, the conversation that Keely and I have been having is to bring in a consultant, a facilitator, uh, to, to facilitate us through some interviews to make sure that we have the scope of work clear, uh, both some interviews with this group and with some of the hat, the hat structure. Um, maybe now we might want to talk to some of the home fund advisory committee members from the city of Olympia. Uh, so because they may have some lessons learned as we learn how to incorporate this, the home fund uh, for Thurston County into our conversation. Uh, so those interviews will really tighten up the scope and and then from there go into the the actual retreat and and its timing uh to accomplish that scope and so would would um what keely and i would like to recommend if you're okay with it and then i have a, a backup option and I'll, I'll 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 talk about both of them is that we go ahead and engage with a facilitator uh, the city of Olympia is willing to do that engagement, um, and and Keely and I's recommendation is that we engage with Megan Picard from the Athena Group, who has been running the community process uh, for for the city of Lacey as of late. Um, outside of that, uh, we could and Darian's been working, so we're ready on an RFP so that we can go out on the street and have a competitive process. But right now what we're looking at is probably around a $25,000 contract. Uh, and all of us can do that um, very legally and transparently through our small works processes. Um, and given the timeline uh, and how much work we have, you know, Keely and I and, and Carolyn, I'll let you use your own voice, but we did talk about this at lunch. You know, really think, you know, we'd like to go ahead and, and, and see if we can work out an arrangement with Megan and get that uh, you know, on paper and, and so we can move ahead uh, kind of quickly. And, 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 and barring that, we can certainly go out to the, to the, to the street for, for proposals, um, but there's no way that we're doing this retreat in, in, in April and May or March and April, like we talked about if we do that. And even if we don't do that, we might not be done by April, given how much you know, interviews and work needs to be put into the agenda, but it's still it's still fairly possible that we could be having our our our, our retreat sessions in in April. Um, so wanted to just stop there. Um, try not to dig in too much on the scope, uh, unless it's a, a massive omission on my part. But really, are you okay with uh, Carolyn and and Keely and I bringing you back a facilitator and a, and a pretty tight plan in a month? Or do you want us to go out on the streets? Uh, so I'm kind of looking around. Uh, Andy, go ahead. My my only concern is that a, a month is too far away, and I, I know that we've I've had some conversations with other members of the Regional Housing Council um, that maybe between now and the in the retreat, that the Regional Housing Council might need to meet on a a more regular basis. It seems like so much has transpired since the last time the Regional Housing Council met. And now with the addition to the home fund and uh, look at this interlocal agreement that needs to be looked at, it just, it just feels like a month from now is a, is a long time. <laughs> and so I, I don't know what, where the rest of the, housing, the Regional Housing Council is on this, but it just feels like there's a lot to be discussed and to keep everyone up on. And, more communication, the better at this stage of the game. So I, I, maybe we need to meet on a more regular basis until we get to a, to a, a retreat. Just, just thoughts. <laughs> yeah, and I guess just from, I, well, let me, let me hear other thoughts. So, I, so I'm not just responding when I pop, you know, keep the, keep the floor open. Other, other reactions to my, my uh, proposal? Scott. So not so much the proposal, I just had a question. So obviously HAD is a critical partner in this discussion as we go forward, but does the retreat, should we limit it to members of the RHC just because we have an interlocal agreement that needs to be amended? There's a, some key things need to be resolved amongst the partners 
Um, I'm just trying to see how that gets folded into the larger discussion. Well, and Keely and I did talk about that specifically, that maybe, and that's kind of why I divided the days, because maybe one or a portion of one of those days is just us, and we go kind of from the big group down to the decision-making body. Um, but we've promised Hat that we will figure out our relationship in this retreat, and I don't think that we can go back on that. Um, I also think that, you know, if folks are using the home fund timeline uh, as as the reason to go fast, uh, we're not going to be putting out any money until 2023. And so we have a minute to make sure we do it right. And, and we cannot burn out our staff. And everyone on this meeting is already doing multiple meetings every month for the RHC. So Carolina. Yeah, can I, I just wanted to add to um, Andy's point. Um, there's like, I feel like there's several projects on right now that, you know, um, and I actually would like to hear from staff on, you know, what they think about, um, because it was one issue that I was going to bring up at the retreat was meeting more frequently and because it's, you know, we saw how it worked last year and we saw how difficult it was uh, meeting once a month and with everything kind of changing so quickly, it was hard to update. And, um, but if, if possible, I don't know if the time is now to discuss this or, or if we should wait, but, um, you know, I, I would like to hear from, from staff if possible. Tom, because of the time, quick quick reactions on that. Yeah, um, purely my uh, kind of personal opinion is, yes, I think the Regional Housing Council there would be benefit toward meeting more often, sometimes once a month. Um, things happen quickly, and, it, and it's hard when you're only meeting once a month to kind of stay up to date. And, and so there's certainly benefit in, in meeting more frequently. And there's a staff capacity issue in terms of being able to support more frequent meetings. So in, until we're able to bring more staff on, um, that would be a challenge for us to support um, at a high level. So certainly it's, it's needed, but also recognize that there is, especially with everything going on, um, our staff capacity is pretty much maxed out. So it would be a challenge for us as well, so. Thank you for that. Carolina, go back. And so then just with hearing kind of that input, then, um, you know, I, I think this is definitely a good conversation to have at the retreat, uh, if that's okay with you, uh, Mayor Ryder. And at that point, we can discuss about the capacity, uh, staff capacity at the RHC and how we're going to support that, um, you know, at a, at a higher level for sure. Um, and then you know, I guess it's from now until until our next meeting, it's up to us to be communicating with each other and making sure that we're keeping each other updated with with anything that comes down the road. Well, I could let me throw a hybrid in there, Andy, before you respond. Um, let's go to two hours now, because right now I think that's our biggest limitation is we're always running up against an hour and a half. And if we can if we can do that, I think that'll help a lot in the in the short term. So um, as I mentioned earlier, I, there's almost two separate processes right here. There's the ongoing business of the Regional Housing Council and its updated um, responsibilities with additional uh, the home fund and, and how that's going to sort of change the RHC going forward. But there's an interlocal agreement that needs to be updated um between all the jurisdictions and and there's a timeline for that as well and so again there's there's that process and then there's the ongoing business of the rhc which is kind of a separate process um so, Romero, that, that that process can't start until olympia and lacy or olympia and, and the county right there interlocal exactly it will inform the next one it, then it will form the other jurisdictions as well i absolutely agree and so um, Romero, when do you think, what is the timeline for that interlocal agreement? Well, that's a good question. So <laughs> obviously I don't have a, a timeline. I will not be able to give you a timeline at this point. We're gonna begin the process. Uh, and one of the first conversations that we're gonna have is Tom as to how we can be start the process and the conversations with the city of Olympia. And, um, <clears throat> you know, I think we have the, the concept in place 
uh, among the two jurisdictions. But uh, as any in local agreement, the complexities will be on the details and just making sure that we walk through those details. And uh, the wild card is making sure the, the attorneys will agree on some of the uh, agreements they, among the staff we reach on that in local agreement. So long answer to your question, Mayor. No, I don't have a, a date for you as to when that will be completed. But certainly there's a sense of urgency from the county and I can probably speak from the city also as a sense of urgency for the city to get going on this. Okay, well, I, I appreciate that. Like I said, those are almost two different processes going on. Just the business of the Regional Housing Council and then this interlocal agreement that's gonna sort of change the Regional Housing Council as well. And so I just know that between those two different processes, there's gonna to need to be more collaboration on a more <laughs> regular basis. So whatever well, that as, You know, I think, I think that's important to keep lifting up. We've all been on a road knowing that our structure is changing for several months now and regardless of the home fund. So, um, you know, if you can just, uh, you know, help us keep moving in that direction, that would be awesome. Um, it's, it's really important that we take the time to catch each other up and realize what we've all been doing to the point Andy made about, you know, the negotiations at the, at the three cities meetings. Um, a lot of us have been doing that too. And so we need to stop having parallel conversations uh, and we need to both, you know, for lack of a better word, both parties need to understand more about what the motivations and the work that's being done because uh, we've done, you know, hundreds of policy decisions and have influenced policy to the point where we just brought $5 million of new money to the table as an RHC working with our county commission. So uh, I, I want to partner and, and I want to keep moving in that direction and Carolyn's going to be the one that gets to drive us there next. <laughs> there we go. And let's not forget too that um, the staffs from all our jurisdictions have a technical team that's been meeting, I think almost weekly. And so <clears throat> those things are keeping things moving as well. Right, cool. Okay, so then within that, is everybody okay going to two hours starting next month? Any, any dissent there? Is there are any we doing e four any to meetings six? that are happening? Michael, go ahead. Are we doing four to six or 3.30 to 5.30? I would say four to six, largely because of day jobs. <laughs> Anyone, no dissent. Tom, is there any implications from the staffing standpoint on that that we need to consider before we decide, Tom? I don't believe so, no. Okay. Okay, that'll, that'll buy us a little bit more time. Uh, because we do have a lot of work to do and, and a lot of a lot of a lot of important places to go together so um that's great that's a, a wonderful thing and then uh so not hearing any dissent uh megan and i will work with or sorry keely and i will work with darian uh to get uh, a, some uh, a negotiation conversation set up with megan at, from the athena group uh and and hopefully bring you a, a really tight uh path forward uh on uh, at our next meeting, which is going to mean that we have to meet a couple times. So if you have any thoughts, please don't hesitate to, you know, use the use your manager or use your rep, um, because we have we do have a, a lot of committees that are that are currently meeting. So what well, one thing I'd <clears throat> like to see if we can investigate in, until we can get to a more frequent meeting schedule is legally whether we're able to call like a special meeting if there's something that requires an action of you know a vote of the council to move forward and if we're able to do that you know, how how much time we need to give uh, public notice on and that sort of thing to keep us on the right track but i think if we could at least get a, a quorum together we could make some of those rapid decisions until we can get some of these other things figured out, but I'd want some backup on, from legal on that. Well, we do have the ability to, to, to have some conversations via email too. So as long as we bring them back around when they aren't making hard decisions. So 
Good, good question. So Tom, that's another assignment for the, I guess probably the planning call this coming month is just what are the rules around a special meetings if we do and how much notice, you know, from your legal since we operate sort of under that county uh, purview from the administrative point. Okay, good. Thank you, Carolyn, for, for bringing that up. Is there anything else for the good of the order? Okay, well, hearing no business uh, before the Regional Housing Council, uh, we are adjourned. Take care, everyone. Thank you. Thanks. Bye, Bye buddy.